observation because now you think about it. So you have a problem that you need to solve. Some came up with a tendons, right? What, did you come up with a solution in the end? What were some possible solutions for absences? Are students not showing up to class? That was your problem for this group, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So what were some uh, some ideas that you came up with? Board work. Board work? Yeah. Group work. Group work? Group work? Pop quizzes. Pop quizzes. Not necessarily at the beginning or the end. Okay. Somewhere in between. Middle. Okay. And think about pop quizzes. Um, when we think about assessment, now you don't have to grade everything in anything, but you can always do a quick assessment to say, are they getting it, right? Could it be group share? Sure. You know, I mean, think about assessment differently. Assessment means you are checking for understanding, okay? And at different points, it will help inform your next step. So, so in thinking about your, your day, right, whether you have a 45-minute period or a 55-minute block or a one hour and a half. Who has an hour and a half? No, all of you are. Yeah. One, some. Some? yeah. So it's going to be different, right? How you break it up, and then students might actually survive the whole time because if you break it up differently, right? We talked about at the beginning having some type of engagement, right? It could be a review from last time. It could be what you're going to do today, a trigger. You know, even if it's talk to your shoulder partner and tell them five things you're going to learn about today. That could be a trigger where you know they looked at the book, and if they didn't, guess what? They open it right then and there, they look. At least they look once, right? I mean, the, sometimes it's Jeez. the little battles, you know, that we have to overcome because that's more than nothing, you know? So shoulder partner work is really good. That also creates a sense of ownership that, you know, well, I'm here, somebody wants to talk to me, I, I feel like I belong. You know, there's a sense of ownership there. Um, lecturing more than 30 minutes is really like, over your head. I mean, it's really, what is the purpose of that? Could you just have gotten it and if they just download the notes, they get the information? What's the point of them being in class? You know, what opportunity are you providing to help make these connections of why they should care? How are you assessing this? Can they walk away telling you why it's important? Surprisingly, teachers and instructors have a hard time figuring out what some of the stuff they teach is important. Weird. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But what about assessing as they leave? You know, what does that look like? Is it an exit slip? Is it something where they plug into a computer? We talked about iPads and the use of, what if you were to use word clouds and actually see, you know, what's something that's stuck with you today, right? Could, you could actually, in one, just by looking at the whole thing, analyze what students walked away with that day. Did they walk away with a better understanding of whatever concept it was, and if they didn't, you're like, oh my gosh, they walked away with one little itty bitty thing, and I really wanted them to walk away with this big idea, then you better do something in the following uh, session to help make that connection, because if you just keep running, 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 you're going to get the same results. You know, you're going to get the same thing. Um, okay, key resources. So that was one, what was the, um, Daniel, your team um, in the back, what was your problem? Projects. Projects. Oh, yeah. All three of us have projects for the students all. Tell me more, because I think that their frame of reference is different. Yeah, they, were trying, they all try to finish it from the 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing we discussed here was that we look at it as we have 15 weeks to deliver this material, and we look at it as I, deliver, I can finish that project in week 15. Okay. Uh, and I told you I was going to look for an app that, that would help you with that. Okay, so project management is so critical in the workforce, and that's one of the main things that employers ask for, and the number one thing students don't have, really, you know, besides showing up on time. Um, okay, so there's one called Get To Do. There's an app. And that app, I'll have to show you because I use it, um, but it's like a, a web, so then... Students create all of the tasks they need to do for that project as a team. So it's, you know, this is a big project. And then they create, you know, all the different tasks that need to be done, and then they get to assign it to the different team members. Just by putting at, you know, Daniel. Then he would get all the at Daniel assignments that he needs to do by a certain date, you know? So that, there are many tools like that. And like I said, if I give you like a whole list, you're not gonna use them. You need to really think, what is it that I need? Where can I find that, right? So productivity app, when it comes to project management, is essential. And you might, some of you might have that um, issue too, right? You assign a project for the end of the year, 
and then there, you know, you have, you get Thanksgiving time, and it's like, oh, got to do it, right? What checkpoints do you have in place for them not to wait to last minute? And that is a critical skill for the workforce. And if you think about it, how are you assessing that? Can that be part of your assessment? Yes, it can. You just have to build it in to where, you know, if you put 100% in your content, you're not saying what you just said earlier when it comes to student outcomes, right? Because you want students to understand what they need to know, but also to be productive citizens in, you know, their careers and their employment. Okay. Um, back here, what was your problem? Our June? problem was kind of bigger. We have students, our problem was underconfidence and overconfidence. Mm -hmm. We have some students who don't know how good they are, and we have some students who think they're better than they are. Okay. Interesting. How did you plan on solving that? We got a list of strategies. Um, we think uh, individual feedback, gradual movement away from kindness, <laughs> Did you hear me? When I was like, I'm real my students, you know, like I was... Exhibit the faculty expertise. Just show them we do know what we're talking about. Um, we have expectations that increase with the level of the class. Talk up engineering as a profession. Often they don't realize they may, you know, they're not doing well. It's a hard field. And they don't realize it's okay. You're in this great, you know, you're, you're way ahead. You're going to have a great profession when you get out there. Um, use the right level of patience with questions from students, which we disagree on. Are <laughs> yeah, you seeing that from experience? <laughs> okay, two things. One, you hit the female self-efficacy when it comes to, for example, a girl cannot handle a C, or in general terms, right? I was able to handle a C. Um, if they get a C, they drop out of the major many times. And my husband, you know, he's... He's like, I barely made it with a C. Yay! You know, so it's a very different, it's a very different perception of what success looks like, and that's a good point. Another an, another idea when it comes to praising progress and the process. Like, I really like how you thought this through, uh, but I see you're struggling with this one. So let's let's brainstorm ideas to get through this one. Because then it's the process, and that's a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset that says, I'm just not good at math, or I'm not good at solving, you know, X, Y, Z problem. So praising for the process helps students build that self-efficacy. It's kind of interesting how, um, how it works. Um, okay, let's do, go ahead, this group, what was your... So we talked a little bit about it, but you want to go ahead in it? Just oh, yeah. One. Well, we had students not coming prepared to class, and part of it was uh, just not bringing the resources that are needed, like a calculator in the case of engineering course. And then for, like, anatomy, physiology, just coming in with basic terminology so you can get started, you know, covering, like, the physiology part to the course. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about access when it comes to tools that you might need in the classroom. Um, and then, Jude, you mentioned that if you put it in the syllabus, the... The VA, the will, VA will pay for it. If but it's, if it's, if it's listed as required, uh -huh. the VA will mm -hmm. pay for it. Did all of you know that? Mm -hmm. I didn't. So yeah. that's something I learned from you that's new, right? That's a really good way to provide access without thinking like I'm providing preferential treatment. You know, you, you cannot think about it that way. But guess what? So say a student still can't get it. Yeah, it says required there, but they still can't get a calculator. What's an alternative? We talked about apps. apps. But then... I thought of a downside. Yeah. <laughs> they can't You're use the cell phone during a test. <laughs> no. That's a good point. <laughs> so then, then that becomes, how does the center provide a resource for them to use that mimics that same app? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like in terms of a tool and resources, you don't want to give them a brand new comp a calculator mm -hmm. that doesn't show what they've been using because then that adds another variable that they don't know how to use a calculator and they're going to do well on the test. Okay. Your, your team? Uh, was um, on my mind. Um, What's advising mind? was on advising. my mind. Advising, interesting. Uh, we have a, a heavy advising load, and how do we better handle it? So we talked about uh, different strategies. Where were some Using of those? technology, and maybe uh, trying to get some uh, interface with our existing DAR system that would help students print off something and come to the advising appointment. Mm -hmm. Ready? With, yes. Because uh -huh. we didn't want to decouple advising from the, the talking about the career and the coaching and all of that, but we're trying to, what I'm trying to do is minimize the administrative piece. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself, every time you have a sheet of paper, is this necessary? Because that's true, paper overload can burden, can burden you. And sometimes, like I said, assessment can be 
like, well, this was the younger students, but I'm sure it could work with the smaller classes, is as they walk out the door, just having a conversation with students about, you know, as they walk out. All right, put two things together, and they're like, oh, uh, you know, and that helps them be ready to actually work on the spot and put thoughts together when it comes to, you know, what they're learning. But, but yeah, when it comes to paperwork and, and that type of thing, like I said, you know, your counselors, your teachers, your parents at, at different times, and just be okay with that. You know, I think it's, it's okay, even though you don't want to have, you know, 150 kids. Somebody I actually dated a guy that asked me, how many kids do you have? And I was teaching middle school at the time. I said, 220. And he was like, what? <laughs> you know, because I really felt that they were all my kids. And I actually didn't have children at the time. But um, anyway, so thank you. And this, so we discussed expectations. Um, so okay. instructor versus student expectations. And we, we were discussing whether or not it was well defined for the students, mm -hmm. even though we give them essentially what our expectations are. In the ah, that's a good right? point. So Who does the giving? We do. <laughs> Why? Because there are expectations. I know, but guess what? Students come up with those same expectations. And so that's what we yeah. just, that's what we were discussing is how does um, they take ownership for the expectations and that could be through a clicker quiz or breakout groups where students, you know, you assess whether or not, you know, what are the expectations for the course? What, what do you have to do? Or, you know, how much time do you have to study? Um, and then compare their uh, answers to what the instructor's expectations are for each person or I, for the group. Yeah, in one of my college courses, I actually did this and it actually worked out really well. So before having my syllabus, I said, you know, this is an introductory biology course. And as, you know, pretty much, the, some of them were non-traditional students, but we just talked about that. As a, an introductory biology course, what do we need to be able, to be sure that we learn together? And then students said, well, we need to be here. We need you to provide examples that are clear. We need you. So some of the things I didn't even call on myself, I'm thinking, oh, they have expectations of me too. <laughs> I didn't even, until I did that, I had never even thought. And think about what a mutual way to build respect with students. Because now they say, you know what? My, for me, I, I don't want to say I promise, but I will be here on time every day. And I expect the same for you, right, from you. So things like that, where they have, it's kind of co-building expectations, co-creating expectations, where you say, you know what, the, the reality is, this is going to be a challenge, a challenging course. However, I have confidence that all of you are going to work hard enough to actually get through this. Not like my Bio 131 professor who said, hi, everyone. Half of you won't be here by the end of the semester. <laughs> Tell me what that builds, how, how does that help build student self-efficacy and, and confidence, right? You just told the students, especially the list that we had here, that you're not good enough, good luck trying to get out of my class with an A or a B. Think about the language we use, right? But what if you change that and say, you know what, the reality is we are here. Ask students, why are you here? That question I ask, why do you teach? Why are they here? And they're going to say, because I want to be able to get a good job someday. Because I'm, oh, then you know what? Let's set those expectations. A good employer is looking for people to be on time. A good employer is, is, is looking for people to take problems and provide solutions, right? You can frame it through that lens. And then they say, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? So use, students come with a lot. It's called funds of knowledge. They come with a lot of things. But when we assume that they need to be told everything, there's no sense of ownership. You know, so keep that in mind, and as we, gosh, conclude, that was quick, my goodness, I will let you, I actually want to see what you write, so if you could take time, here's another answer garden, and there are iPads that Abby can quickly, you know, I, I don't know, quickly, I don't know, quickly, I want you to come up with five, if you can do that, five things. What are five things you want to remember? And then you can access the answer garden there from today. You can write them on your paper, but I also want you to put them in the app so we can actually see the cloud. But five things you want to remember from today. And it was a lot of information, a lot of overload. But from today's experience, five things. How many iPads do you want? Um, for, you can do per group because they can, they can type together. So we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six.
Revamp all your lesson plans, you know? That's a very actionable thing. <laughs> all of them? <that? laughs> no, maybe one. You know, okay, well, okay. I think after 5 p.m. today, because I am trying to let you go. You're still here. Okay, so this table over here, what are some things you want to remember from the workshop? Types of bias. Types of bias, okay. Working in threes. Working in threes. Keeping the concepts, key concepts. Key concepts, yeah. making them key, right? Yeah. Not just everything and anything. Mm -hmm. um, equality and equity. Equality and equity. Mm -hmm. Intersectionality. Yes, my favorite word now. I like intentionality too. That's another favorite word for me. Just think about it. You have to be intentional. Okay, we'll put that one. Intentionality. <laughs> <laughs> what about this side over here? Why I so teach? Where are they going? Intentional course design. Intentional. And expectations. Expectations. What course design did you get that one? Okay. What about the back? Table over there. <laughs> I like the intentional learning spaces. Intentional learning spaces. And asking expectations. Value proposition in education. Value proposition? Yes. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It's like, gives meaning to life. Value proposition. Um, Co-creation, I want to add. I think that's something you think about. How do you co-create things without... And yes, you want to acknowledge that you're the expert, 
But students also want to, uh, a lot of students, they want to be like you. So how, what, what spaces are you creating so they could be experts too? But you saying, I'm the expert, you don't know anything, is not it, <laughs> right? So co-creation is something that I want you to be thinking about as, as you train these future engineers how to be engineers, right? Know right. where students are. Yes. Okay. Know where students are? Like, you know, what is their basis? You know, what are they thinking? What are they coming with? Mm -hmm. I think we have expectations of that, but do we really know? How do we know? Uh -huh. So assessment and, assessment and prior learning, what do they know? What do they come up with? Okay. Um, I'm going to add risk. You being here is a risk in itself. You know, there's, a, there's this sense of like, I do things the way I do them because that's what I know, right? So trying something new is a risk. And that's okay, you know? Um, <coughs> so how many, let's see, which one's really standing out for people as something that they... Expectations. Expectations? Do you want to try something again? Do you want to try something again? No, it's just no, not is updating. It? Really? No, yeah. That's weird. Yeah, it's, it's um, weirdness. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, there you go. Faulty it's app. saying up there that you can only submit the answer once. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe my um, maybe my setting was was incorrect. So if you do it, the first one I had it right. So make sure that multiple responses can be. Uh, but obviously they're bigger. We can actually read them. You know, <laughs> from the other one. All right, well, with that, before we go, one thing from each, we're going to quickly, okay, we're going to go in order, so like this, all the way around, we're going to lead to the back, and then we're going to end up with you. One action thing you're going to do after you today. I'm going to talk to Liz Duran about Dara's flexibility for advising. Okay. One thing you're going to do. I'm going to assign quiz in every class to read your stuff. <laughs> you're going to quiz, 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 <laughs> until you <they> die. <laughs> Think about why you're giving quizzes. Is it to assess what they know before, uh -huh. or what they're learning? Yeah. Okay, be intentional about your quizzes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work on alternative forms of assessment. Alternative forms of assessment, okay. More continuous assessment, sort of like what the yeah, story. Uh, different yeah. ways. Different ways, okay. I'm going to diversify my curriculum and use the shifting practice as a guide for developing that. Okay. I'd like to go check the apps you're talking about, the oh. project management. And you might find a better one. Yeah. Guess what? Share it. And then uh, you'll get the Google Doc that has all the resources, and you can add to it so other people can know about it. Okay. If I find a better one. Yeah. <laughs> the spider one. Too. I'll take the class as a story and motivate students. A story? Yeah, tell a story. They might be able to tell that story to you, say, you know what? I learned this in your class 10 years ago. All right. So I think more about underconfidence and overconfidence. Okay. I have something. Say that, but I forgot. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I'll try to do an exercise about the expectations. We teach online classes before handing any material or anything. Let's try down and talk with your panel and see what are you expecting from my classes and then maybe work on those. Okay. What about the learning spaces? Learning spaces? Yeah. <laughs> learning can be anywhere, anytime. Remember that too. Think about that. There's here learning, but there's also what do you. What about the real world? What about outside? How, how can you use that? Okay. Uh, develop a resources tool to help students understand my expectations. Okay. What's real to students? What's real? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. What's real life to students? Might not be what you're thinking. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. The expectations that these two gentlemen. Okay. Start with that. Mm -hmm. Building a learning community for these students. Yes, learning community. Be surprised. We watch out for each other when we know we're a part of a team. Yeah. Seeing what kind of assumptions I have about expectations. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. yeah. I am going to work on the shifting practice and trying to um, get you know, ways that I can un have students understand what the value is of learning in classes mm -hmm. and teaching. Assessing clear communication of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, expectations. And the students do live up to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say you'd be surprised, but that should be an expectation that they live up to. Um, uh -huh. Try back to the expectations. Yeah. Or understanding their expectations. Yeah. Modify my student biography. I collect first 
okay. us meeting to include the expectations and revisit it after the first exam. Or it even, but you know, think about it as you as you build your classroom culture. Mm -hmm. To if you do something where you compile the responses, you say, you know what, ninety percent of you thought that this was a really important one. All of you had it, so let's let's check this one because right now it doesn't look like we're doing very well, you know. Mm -hmm. And actually check uh, throughout, not just at the final exam, because mm -hmm. you're gonna go and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. And, yep. Uh, I won't talk to you at five p.m. But you know what I mean. Like I'm yep. sure that that'll be something. Okay, so with that, you are going to get two items um, once I leave, and you're going to get the access to the links here um, that I showed you, and you're also going to get um, the, a copy of the PowerPoint, that way you have it for the future. Um, but I really want to appreciate, you know, oh, I was going to say that that, that um, this visual, this organizer, it's a four-day workshop, just so you know, to actually build that course. Yeah. Huh? So that's reality for you, you know. And I'm actually going to do it with some some teachers at Poudre um, High School. They're they're building a course called 21st Century Science, where they're actually kind of revamping the way they think about you know science education. They actually want to say, if we do a project based, what does it look like? So we're going to talk about that. But just know that baby steps are baby steps. It's something. It takes time. Okay. And I'm confident that you will take action. And thank you for being here today.